The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello and welcome back to Element 14 Presents. My name is Derek and in this video I want to share with you a project that I've been working on. It's called a Rubens tube. Now a Rubens tube is a classic physics demonstration that dates back to the early 1900s that shows how resonance and standing waves work inside of a sealed tube full of propane. Now we'll get into the physics of what a Rubens tube actually is and how it functions but basically uh, it is a long tube sealed off on one end the other end it's sealed off with a uh, latex membrane and then there's a speaker attached to it. We pump propane through the tube continuously and we have a bunch of holes drilled at the top where the propane can escape. We ignite the propane and by driving different frequencies uh, at the speaker, uh, we can generate different flame patterns. Now what's cool about it is I show you how to interface to uh, a microcontroller by uh, hitting a series of, I guess what I'm calling tone bars and uh, we're taking a, a physical impulse and turning it into an electrical impulse, then clamping it down so we can safely feed it to a microcontroller. From there, we figure out which note was hit and then we generate a sine wave using pulse width modulation to drive the speaker of our Rubens tube. So hopefully you can take the information presented here and make your own instruments that are probably a little safer and won't burn your house down. So I'm excited about it, so let's get started. Amazing Hacks. Inspired Designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Look, I know you want to make one of these things, uh, but it's dangerous. I don't go into uh, the proper way to weld it. I don't go into leak checks. I don't go into the proper fittings and thermodynamics as things heat up and things can melt with catastrophic results. Now, what I do recommend is you copy what's safe in this video, using the transducers to uh, create a musical instrument or creating sine waves with uh, pulse width modulation. Everything else, please don't do it at home. Thank you. So how does the Rubens tube work and what is resonance? So imagine that I drive the speaker with a single impulse. It's going to travel down the tube and it's going to bounce off the end of this and come back. That is a reflected wave, okay? Now, if that wave happens to hit this speaker, at the same time I send another impulse, they'll effectively cancel each other out. However, if that wave traveling back hits the speaker, bounces off, and then at the right moment, I energize it again, I add more energy into that wave, it's gonna travel down the tube at a larger amplitude. That's effectively what resonance is. Now, a standing wave is basically a wave that is reflected off the end and interferes with the driving wave, okay, the source. Now, where a peak and another peak come together, they are going to add together, okay? That's constructive interference, and we call that an antinode. Now, where a peak and a valley come together, they're gonna to cancel each other out. That is destructive interference, and we call that a node. And along our flame tube, that will be the minimum flame height or no flame at all. Okay, so the next bit of the equation is um, the tone bars, as I'm calling it. So I went out and got some of this uh, handy dandy plastic and cut some of these slots on the table saw. So they'll isolate the impact between each note hopefully. And the piezo elements will be uh, glued to the rear side and those will detect a impact. And all the signals that come from the clamping circuits of each of these will get fed into the microcontroller and the GPIO pins. Um, it will determine which note was hit and then the frequency and note will be uh, displayed here on the LED display and um, it will then generate through uh, a lookup table the PWM signal required to produce that particular frequency. Uh, that will go through this low pass filter that I'm just going to leave on this beautiful Element 14 uh, presents breadboard, okay, with an LM324 and a low pass filter. That will feed our power amplifier that will drive the speaker of our Rubens tube. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is clamp the voltage coming from our piezo element, all right? This guy right here. One side goes to ground, the other side goes to a Zener clamping circuit, which consists of a Zener diode and a current limit resistor. Now, from the piezo element, we're going to see 
uh, voltage spikes around 200 volts and we need to get that down to about 2.7 and we need to limit the current going into this diode so we don't damage it. So 100K resistor should suffice. We're gonna see 2.7 volts here. That gets fed into our microcontroller. And of course we have eight of these. So anytime uh, we get a pulse here, the microprocessor will detect that with an interrupt on change. So that needs to be set up in the firmware. Anytime that signal changes, it says, hey, a note has been hit. Let's figure out which note was hit. And then we need to change the uh, PWM signal at the output. So we'll clip one lead across the uh, transducer output and we'll clamp the other lead to the output of the Zener diode. So that should be the regulated 2.7 volt output. We'll give it a couple of wax and we'll see what it looks like. Okay, channel one here is the raw output from the transducer. So you can see that uh, both uh, channel one and channel two are the same scale, two volts per division. The raw signal coming from the transducer is about two, four, six, eight, ten, uh, twelve 10, 12 divisions. So, you know, we're seeing 24 volts there. That's far too much to feed into a microcontroller. Trace number two is the output of the Zener uh, clamping diode circuit. You can see it goes negative by 0.7 volts, which is normal for any diode. Um, but the great thing about the Zener is we can, uh, by selecting the proper part number, determine what the upper clamping limit is. So I'm feeding a 3.3 volt microcontroller. Um, this will not exceed 2.7 volts here. So it turns out that our Zener clamping circuit is going to work perfectly for this application. Hi, I'm David from Element 14's The Electronics Inside. Join me as I tear down toys, tools, appliances, modern, vintage, classics, and even some new releases just to find out what's inside. Okay, so with pulse width modulation, what we're doing is we're setting up a certain frequency, okay? So we can see the periodicity here. We have these pulses that are coming at equal time intervals. If we have a large pulse width, okay, so like 90% of that period is high, then if we average that voltage out, we're gonna get a high output DC voltage. So say if this was zero volts, 10 volts max, at 90%, we would have nine volts out, okay? Now, if we take the same circuit, but we just change the duty cycle, the, period, the frequency or period stays the same, but we're only high for a very short period of time, say at 10% duty cycle, then our output voltage, if we average it out, is going to be very low. We'll have like one volt. So as we scan through our lookup table, we're actually gonna change the pulse width modulation values, the duty cycle, uh, from like uh, close to 100% down to zero, okay? And what that's going to do is produce a sine wave that is embedded inside of that signal we're gonna to need to pull that out with a low pass filter. Now there's an inherent problem in using pulse width modulation to create a sine wave, and that is we have all of these sharp edges, okay? Anytime you have a sharp transition, you're going to generate harmonic content. What I mean by that is in the frequency domain, if we look at all the frequencies involved that are produced, uh, we're going to have, you know, in the tens of kilohertz up to 100 kilohertz of just noise that's going to make our output sine wave look crazy. So we're gonna to have to filter that out. Okay, so I was able to find experimentally just by sweeping through the range of frequencies on the Rubens tube that the highest resonant frequency is about 504 Hertz. So anything contained within that pulse width modulated signal that we're varying to create our sine wave, we wanna keep everything at or below 504 Hertz. So I could probably just create a low pass filter at about two kilohertz, one kilohertz, and have a fairly shallow roll off and attenuate any switching noise um, from that PWM signal. Now we can use this uh, piece of test gear back here. This is a dynamic signal analyzer. And it's kind of like a low frequency spectrum analyzer. It allows us to see what's happening in the frequency domain. So let's take a closer look and see exactly what's contained within that PWM signal and what we want to remove. First off, I apologize for the lines, but uh, that's the scan rate of the screen interfering with the shutter speed. So I've set the bandwidth from zero to 625 Hertz. So we can see 
our peak signal here is at about 500 hertz. Now if I zoom out to a bandwidth of 100 kilohertz, our frequency is still down here. You see the marker, but we have a lot of energy here, a lot of high frequency content. If I bring the marker over, we can see that it's at about 40 kilohertz, and that's the switching speed of my PWM signal. Now we also have an upper harmonic here of 78, 79 kilohertz. So this stuff we're gonna have to filter out. So we can create a low pass filter to allow all of our signals on the low end to pass through and we can severely attenuate these upper switching frequencies. That should give us a fairly clean sine wave, at least enough for the Rubens tube. Now in our case, we're using a single pole RC low pass filter. Essentially, it is a frequency dependent voltage divider. The impedance of the capacitor will change as the frequency goes up, attenuating high frequency content and allowing low frequency content to pass through. We have a cutoff frequency or F sub C that you see here. And the formula that we use to select the resistor and capacitor is given on the bottom right here. F sub C is equal to one over two pi, our values of resistance times capacitance. So anything to the left of F sub C, our cutoff frequency is considered passband. Anything that the, we're going to feed the Rubens tube will pass through. Anything to the right of F sub C is going to be considered in our stop band and will be attenuated. Now I need to connect a potentiometer to vary the output voltage. Now any impedance or reactive components that I place on the output of this RC circuit are going to change the cutoff frequency and we don't want that. We want that to remain stable. So what I'm going to do is use an LM324 in a non-inverting buffer configuration to isolate any impedances so that as I turn a volume control, it's not going to change F sub C or the cutoff frequency. Here is our breadboard circuit for our low pass filter. We have our 0.1 microfarad capacitor. We have an 800 ohm resistor here. This forms our RC uh, single pole filter that runs at uh, about two kilohertz. Uh, this is just a bypass capacitor for the power supply. And um, the LM324 here just forms the buffer amplifier between our volume circuit, which is not connected, and uh, our, our filter elements right here. So let's look at the waveforms here. I've got a probe connected to the input and I've got a probe connected to the output. And we'll look at the pulse width modulated signal at the input and what the resultant waveform is. Okay, trace number one up here is going to be our analog output and trace number two is our pulse width modulated signal. It's tough to see the uh, pulse width modulation as we're zooming out to uh, change, but uh, you'll definitely see the sine wave start to appear. So we've got that sine wave riding in here, that's our low frequency stuff, and then we have the high frequency stuff inside of there. But our filter does a pretty good job considering it's only a single pole and uh, just a simple RC filter. Now all we have to do is put everything together and hope that it works. I figured this is a good spot to pause the video and just point out the nodes and anti-nodes. Here are the nodes at a minimum flame height, and these are the anti-nodes at the maximum flame height. You'll notice that as I hit different notes, the amplitude is much higher for the low frequencies and lower for the high frequencies. That's partially an artifact of the tube itself, but also the frequency response of the speaker I'm using. Anyway, enjoy the rest of these rather unpleasant sounds.
Well, that's all the time that we have for today. If you do end up using this technique, I would really love to hear about it. So please leave a comment down below if you've done something similar or this has made an improvement to something you've already made. I would love to know about it. And of course, engage with us at the Element 14 community at element14.com presents. Have a good one.